And so we come to our final story, the sixth one. And the circumstances described in this interview happened over 15 years ago. I was diagnosed with meningococcal septicemia in 1999. I was four months in hospital, very unwell, and the recovery took about a year, and I was on lots of medications. I had a boyfriend, and we were only going out a couple of weeks. I was on the pill, and we also used condoms. The night that the condom broke, I was also aware that the medication that I was using could undermine the pill, so I was really worried. I went to a family planning clinic to speak to somebody about getting a morning after pill. And they said, you're not going to get the morning after pill unless you get a referral from the rape crisis centre. And that wasn't the context of why I had been there. So I got the train from Galway to Dublin. I got the train from Dublin to Belfast. It was really, really stressful. Anyway, I get the morning after pill and then I thought that that was it. I was, had, had nothing to worry about at that point. I'd covered all my bases in terms of my protection. And then three weeks later, I do a pregnancy test and it comes back positive. My world absolutely fell apart. My family were very conservative and I was afraid of the shame I was going to bring on them. They were just trying to recover themselves from my illness from the previous year where they were worried that I wasn't going to survive. So the last thing I wanted to do was bring another drama on them about this crisis pregnancy. Like many of my peers who've been in the same situation, I went to them first because I didn't know what to do. The only information at the time is crisis pregnancy organisations. And I thought I can go in there and they can direct me on all of my options. And at that point I'd already decided I really wanted to have an abortion. I could see my whole future laid out for me. I was being offered a job and these are all the opportunities I was going to have to turn down if I went forward with the pregnancy. And also I was concerned what damage the pregnancy was doing to my body as I was still recovering from the meningitis. I was really hoping for somebody who was going to be sympathetic to my situation and give all of the information that was not possible to get. I knew my contemporaries were going to England to get abortions, but I wanted to know, who do you call? How do you book it? She said, but you do realise your baby has a heartbeat now. I was like, this isn't a baby. This is a, a group of cells. I'm only five weeks pregnant. And she said, you know that in this country that having an abortion is illegal. If somebody discovers that you've had an abortion, you could go to jail for 14 years. And I was told that in what was supposed to be a counselling situation. I kind of felt I was in a total shotgun situation. And I also felt really guilty as well. I thought, oh my God, I've been so selfish. I'm not thinking about this baby. I've been thinking about me. Now, having that perspective, I just feel that was complete manipulation of the situation that I found myself in. I was very, very vulnerable, terrified. I mean, 20 years old, no information available to you. So I remember leaving the office feeling utterly even worse, I think, you know, that actually a judgment had been made against me. So I rung my aunt, who had lived in England for 20 years, and I thought, she's going to know what to do. She was brilliant and she told me about Marie Stopes and she told me how much it would cost and she said she was going to come with me and oh god I was actually having that was brilliant you know having somebody just to say you're not alone but I think for me the damage had been done by that conversation with the counsellor because I think a seed was planted at that point and what I ended up being more worried about was people finding out that I was pregnant and I had done something about the pregnancy. I was worried that somebody would say something to the guards. So in that fear, I made a decision to continue on with the pregnancy. I eventually told my mother, my mother was really adamant, you're not allowed to go to have an abortion, it's a sin. We won't be able to look at you again. If you make that decision to go to England, then you won't get the support that you need here. But if you go the other way, we will offer you the support with the baby. The boyfriend at the time was unwilling to deal with it. As I went forward and had the baby, I ended up on my own because he was unwilling to be there to support the baby either. The health concerns did actually manifest in the pregnancy. I had the baby when I was seven and a half months because my liver went into shock. So he was premature. I loved him. I can tell you I loved him from the moment I saw him and I loved feeling him kick inside me 
in the same way that since and I've had other children, I have loved those babies. But what I do not like about this whole thing was that decision about being pregnant and living with the consequences of all of that was forced upon me. And there was no access to information to get another alternative. And the decision that I made going forward and having my son did ultimately change the trajectory of my whole life. I ended up having to come out of college, working minimum wage jobs. I was on housing lists. All of my choices became really, really limited really quickly as soon as I had him. Whereas I look at the other person that created him and he had nothing holding him back. I'm 37 now and I look back at my, all of my 20s when all of my friends were traveling yeah. the world or progressing into education or into employment. And I was queuing up to get a one parent family payment or somebody was calling on the door to investigate whether I was conning the system or asking questions about my private life. A judgment was put up on my whole life. I had to live with all of these consequences. Any sense of um, privacy or dignity went out the window when I had to make that choice. I mean, I just think of, you know, the, the founding document of our proclamation was cherish all the children of the state equally. I didn't feel cherished. And I'm a child of the state. I was totally and utterly othered by my constitution, by the legal system, by access to information or access to progression as a, a human. And then you're not allowed to talk about it. You're not given any kind of platform to say, hang on a second, there's no equality here. That makes you feel very isolated and angry. It's not that I regret having him. I absolutely adore my son. I'm very happy that I have him now, but I do feel that a huge opportunity was lost by being forced to make that decision. Yeah. It's about choice. It's about actually somebody trusting you and really listening to what your fears are and saying, that's a really valid concern. Are you sure that that's what you want to do in life? Okay, well, if that's what you want to do, and well, I accept that decision and I'm going to support you in that choice. Yeah. And I'm going to be there for you afterwards when you've made that choice. Going forward, what I would really like is my country to be aware that there's another 50% of the population here. And how can you make them feel cherished? So I'd like to thank that woman for sharing her story with us and asking you again just to take a final two to three minutes just to jot down the impact of hearing that story in you. It may be just a few words, might be a sentence, but just to hold something of the experience of listening to that story.